Hello everyone and welcome to the first installment of Bread Basket Monday. We've got some really cute little cookbooks from the 70s that's all about bread and I thought we would explore one of them. This is one I picked up from the library book sale, of course. I think I paid all of one whole dollar for it. And I did check on eBay and apparently um, this book is going for, um, you know, a fair little amount around in the $20 to $50 range depending on where you get it from and, you know, what the shipping cost is. So apparently I got very lucky getting this uh, for just a dollar. Now this has an interesting uh, little take on it. We have a husband and wife team. Um, the wife is from Germany. She's the one that has made all the recipes. And the husband from England is an artist. And he went ahead and illustrated uh, the entire book for her, which is really cute. I like this uh, particular style of art. I think it really lends a lot of um, just overall homey coziness to the book. And it's also very indicative of the 70s. I really like the 70s um, illustrative um, style. Now, the book is set up a little bit different than your uh, typical recipe uh, cookbooks. You'll see we've got the recipe here. We've got the directions on this side. All of the directions are completely illustrated step by step. Hopefully that means a no fail recipe. I thought we'd just go ahead and start with the very first recipe in the book, the old English farmhouse loaf. It looks nice and rustic and good. I've already done some, uh, well, actually lots of Googling to figure out exactly how much yeast I'm going to need because none of my grocery stores actually carries um, cakes of fresh yeast. I'm sure I could probably find it somewhere, but I'd have to do some driving. So I'm just going to stick with my uh, dry yeast and see how that goes. Now I've got our ingredients here. The only couple of substitutions I'm going to do is I'm going to try to use up uh, my bread flour instead of all purpose. Hopefully that won't come back to haunt me later. And I'm going to be using lactose free milk. Um, so I don't have any issues uh, with eating it later and hopefully that won't make any difference. So I believe we're ready except for one thing. I need to pour my tea. I've got my teapot boiling here on the stove and of course with any undertaking of this magnitude such as bread baking we always need a good cup of tea to fortify ourselves through the process. And now that that's taken care of, I think we're ready to start. I've already got my oven light on. I'm gonna go ahead and preheat my oven just very, very, I mean like maybe one minute, just to get this nice and warm so that when it starts the rising process, it'll have a nice little um, warm area to go to when I put the bowl in there. So let's go ahead and get started.
so I knew I was gonna need a cup of tea for this. I ran into a couple of problems. Let me go ahead and show you what the problem was and what I did to try to fix it. So first off, you will have seen that um, I had to switch from my regular bowl to a roasting pan. Um, you may have wondered why, and that's because it was obviously overfilling the bowl, was not going to fit, and guess what? I don't have another big bowl. I thought I did. Uh, I must have, I don't know, given it to someone, let them borrow it, got rid of it. I have no idea what happened to it, but the giant bowl is gone, so... Instead, I had to pull this out, which is okay because we just had to get a little creative and thank goodness I had a giant roasting pan. You saw that it did all fit, so that was good. Another problem was my poor little Hamilton Beach. So if I had um, one of those professional kitchen aids, I probably would have been able to get all of that dough in there and be able to probably just do the entire process in this. However, I've got a little Hamilton Beach. Now I've had this for years and it does good. It really tries hard, but you can see the bowl um, is a little bit on the smaller side. There was no way all of that was going to fit in there. So you saw I had to just kind of knead it by hand for a little bit um, until I could get it to where I could break it off in sections and then put it in here. Now, I didn't film that process because it was kind of a long and irritating um, process to do. Um, but I did manage to get, um, you know, the sections of dough in there. And I needed these two together. I had three sections all together. And now I'll need to uh, knead this in with the rest of it. I did need to add more warm water than what the recipe called for just to get it all together but that's okay um that happens with a lot of recipes it just depends on humidity elevation um what kind of flour you used so if you need to add a little bit of water to you know make it form the dough um don't freak out that's um you know fairly normal i've done it with other breads before now what i'm going to do is wash this because we need to let that dough raise and if it's going to double in size it is definitely not going to fit that bowl so i'm going to wash this and grease it and we'll put the dough in here and we're just going to let it hang out in the roasting pan um, for about an hour or so let it raise and we're going to see what happens I'm a little bit doubtful. I don't know. It's pretty spongy. I think we're getting there, but I'm going to go ahead and knead it some more um, just because, well, obviously I've got to get that in there too, but um, just to get it a little bit more springy and then uh, we'll see what happens. But that is kind of what happens when you pick a recipe and decide that looks like fun. Let's just go ahead and do it instead of making sure that you have the equipment to do it. So, I don't know. I'm going to have to go on a search spree, I guess, to find where that giant bowl went. And maybe for Christmas, I'll ask for a giant professional KitchenAid. I don't know. I've always wanted one. They're really expensive. Maybe I can get one used. I don't know. We'll look around. <laughs> Woo! That was a workout. <laughs> and that was with me letting the uh, mixer do part of the work. I actually had to get up on my tippy toes uh, just so I could get enough leverage um, to push down uh, for part of it. So this is a big, uh, this is a big dough um, and it's pretty dense. So it was really hard to get that in there. 
Um, the women of Merry Old England must have had arms of steel because that was quite the workout. But I've already got our pan washed and greased. So our next step is to put that in there and we will cover that with a cloth. Hopefully it's going to actually raise and do something in the oven. Um, and then we will go on to the next step. So wish this little thing some luck. I think it's going to need it. And me, I think I'm going to need a second cup of tea. It's been a little past an hour. So let's go ahead and check. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah, it, oh, it definitely doubled in size and look at that. All right, that's a good dough. We're gonna pull this out. Um, they said to knead it uh, for a little bit, you know, punch it down and knead it some more. So we are going to do that and then we will let it rise for another 30 minutes. Now I went ahead and re-wet the towel, um, you know, just because it was kind of a little bit dry, but not too bad. And I also turned my oven back on just for like a few seconds, just to get that nice warmth back in there. And we've got 30 more minutes on that, and then we are ready to bake. But in the meantime, I found something really cool at the farmer's market this last Saturday. So let's go out into the greenhouse and I will show you what I found. First off, can you believe this? This is an actual, uh, I mean, really good sized branch that fell off of this tree. Uh, this would happen last night during a really, really bad thunderstorm. So you can see we'll probably end up having to take this uh, tree down because it's just gonna get water down in it and start to rot uh, and become really dangerous. As you can see, it was probably already dangerous. Um, kinda got my crate myrtle right there, but we managed to salvage most of it, so I think he's gonna be okay. But here's a little project that we'll be um, cutting out and dragging out of our backyard. <laughs> And as for the little surprise that I found at the farmer's market, look at this plant. Some of you may already know what this is, um, but one of the most common names is Mother of Thousands. Let me go ahead and pull it down and I'll show you why. You can see here all of these little plants all along each one of these leaves is actually a baby that will fall off into the soil and then start a plant of its own. This is native to uh, Madagascar, which is an island off Africa. And, you know, people um, have just been kind of uh, bringing it over into Europe and America because it's just such a cool plant. Um, if you do get one, you need to be really careful not to uh, let it get too out of control because it is considered uh, in some areas an invasive species, which is why I'm keeping it in a pot. Uh, it will die in the winter, so I will need to pull this in. But if you're in some place like uh, Florida, Hawaii, uh, you know, things like that, you're not going to have a winter that's going to kind of kill this off, so it can take over native species. But the really cool thing about this is these little babies, like I said, will drop down, and wherever they land, that's where they start uh, the little pl uh, baby plants. You can see there's some underneath that's actually, oh, there was one, and now he'll probably start right there. Um, but you can see there's some that's getting bigger, uh, you know, underneath the plant. And I went ahead and got this tray also, filled it with dirt because as these fall off, I can go ahead and put them in here to get them started. And you can see I've already got a few. And, you know, I'll probably just give them away and, um, you know, gifts or whatever. Maybe take them next time I go to the farmer's market. If I get a bunch, I'll just, you know, kind of give them to whoever wants to come up to the booth and take one. 
but it was too cool for me to pass up. The person that sold it to me also said that in the middle, this will eventually come up with a flower and bloom, and I think that's going to look really cool. Another thing I got from a fellow master gardener is this turmeric. So the turmeric is uh, underneath here, the soil, and what it will do is shoot rhizomes uh, through the dirt and it will shoot up uh, more of these little leaves and plants and eventually just uh, overtake this whole tub. Now the master gardener I got it from just had so many tubs of turmeric where it had just spread and what she does is you know just takes them out and separates them and puts them in other tubs soon she's got even more so i can't wait for this i'm really excited this is something i'll also have to take in i don't think it'll um overwinter very well in this um unheated greenhouse so i will be babying this one now this will be kind of an experiment for me because obviously i've never grown turmeric before but if all goes well uh, I may be able to do some really cool turmeric recipes on the channel. So wish this little plant luck and hopefully we'll have some good eating soon. All right, we're on the second rise. Let's see what it did. Oh, okay. Wow, man, this is doing so good. But I realized that uh, I almost missed a step. So I thought it was only two rises, but we actually uh, need to cut this into uh, its little shapes. And once we get that ready, we leave it to prove until doubled in size. Then we bake it. So let's go ahead and do that. And then we've got one more process. Hopefully that's it. And then we can go ahead and bake this. they are in there hopefully um, this process will not take too long I don't think so because again I preheated my oven for just a couple of seconds to get it nice and warm in here the cookbook also said to use a dry cloth this time so that's what we've done we will shut this up and hopefully soon we will finally have some bread to eat and hopefully this is the last time you're gonna see me do this <laughs> but i do believe that these have doubled in s oh yeah wow look at that now this one kind of accidentally broke apart um a little bit but that's okay we still have one that's um you know fairly pretty so we're gonna go ahead i'm gonna pull these out then I'm going to preheat the oven and then we will bake them and next time you see these hopefully they will be done. Okay let's hope that I didn't make two rocks instead of two loaves of bread. They're really heavy um, and they got some give to them. I don't know if you can see that or not. There's some give but it is pretty hard they might be doorstops I don't know but the recipe did say that it will have a crisp crust so I think that's what I've got let's go ahead and cut you know the end off of one of these and just see what it tastes like if it tastes good then we can kind of forgive the appearance a little bit right <laughs> Thank you. 
Now I have some hope because the inside is really nice and soft and springy. So let's just go ahead and I'm going to try it and tell you if this was actually worth it. Okay, I stand corrected. This is really good. Um, it's actually not too hard on the outside. It's actually just perfect. It's got that little bit of bite and crust and resistance to it, but it soon gives way and you get that nice, soft, um, pillowy inside. Now, of course, I put a lot of butter on it, so, you know, that's going to make it even better, but... Even without the butter, I think it would be really good. Um, it reminds me of a much, much tastier version of England's National Loaf when they had the World War II rationing bread. So it does, it's kind of reminiscent of that in which, you know, you can tell this has got a lot of whole wheat in it. So it's not something that you're just going to like chew once and swallow like a Wonder Bread a white loaf. But it's really satisfying and strangely addictive. I just kind of want to keep eating this piece. Um, I will, but first, <laughs> as for this cute little book, I'm so glad that I picked it up for a dollar. It's totally worth it to me. Because, you know, I love its vintage appeal and look. And, still, you know, this recipe was really good. So it gives me hope for the other ones. We will visit uh, this book again because I'm going to be making more out of it. So if you want to just pick the one or two recipes that I'm going to do out of this and then call it a day, you know, I think that would be a good thing too. Especially with this one, if you really like whole wheat bread and breads has got some weight to it, I think you're really going to like this one. Now you will be all day at home because, you know, you saw how often I had to let this rise. But if you're going to be home all day anyway, why not bake yourself a couple of loaves of bread and you'll have some great toast for the next day. Spread some jam on it and you're good to go. So hope you really enjoyed this first installment of Bread Basket Mondays. I will hope to do another one next month. I'd like to go ahead and do, like I said, a couple more out of this one and out of this little book that I picked up uh, for a dollar at the Habitat for Humanity Restore in Johnson City. And I'm really excited about that because it's got some really healthy looking um, whole wheat breads in there, including some that use carob. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So we will be looking at some other unusual breads. So thank you for watching this episode. Hope you stay tuned for the next one and I'll see you then. Bye. And if you like historical cooking and unusual cookbooks, here's two more videos you might enjoy. And make sure to like and subscribe for more foodie adventures.